Welcome to Harvard Divinity School. Uh, thank, you. thank you all so much uh, for coming to share in this evening of honor uh, for a wonderful teacher and colleague and, uh, and scholar. Uh, I'm Dan McCannon. I hold the uh, Emerson uh, Chair here at the Divinity School and uh, I'm happy to be serving as, as Master of Ceremonies today. Uh, I was an undergraduate uh, here about the time uh, Conrad Wright retired uh, from the faculty and since I was neither a uh, Unitarian Universalist nor a historian at the time, I did not have the pleasure of, of learning from him then but I was so deeply grateful arriving on the faculty 20 years later uh, at his generosity in welcoming me and sharing his syllabi uh, and uh, in quizzing me as um, <laughs> uh, to make sure that I would be a faithful steward of the tradition he had, he had stewarded for uh, so long. Uh, um, uh, this event, as you know, is co-sponsored by Harvard Divinity School and by the Unitarian Universalist History and Heritage Society. And so I'd like to invite um, Dean Bill Graham uh, first to welcome everyone on behalf of Harvard. Thank you. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to be able to at least say a couple words of welcome to all of you here to the Sperry Room, where Conrad taught for many years. Of course, in that time, it was not set up like this. It was a, a train car room. Some of you probably remember. I certainly do from the 1960s. And uh, uh, it, it's changed now. But Conrad got to see all of this. He was often here in the last years uh, for various events. Um, I did not study with him, but several of my friends in the mid-60s, when I was first here as a graduate student, did uh, study with him. I was busy doing things like Sanskrit and Arabic and so on, and he was, uh, of course, teaching his, uh, his fabled uh, New England church history courses uh, and doing his fable walking tours uh, of all the sites in Boston faster than the students could keep up with him. Yes. And uh, he was renowned for this. And, uh, and, and I had two very close friends who did do courses with him. One was Peter Gomes, the other was Kendall Folker. Both are sadly now deceased, but, uh, but both of them uh, spoke in such wonderful terms. And I found Conrad very imposing when I was still a student. He was, or fairly frightening, I think, uh, uh, because I uh, was introduced to him a couple times and I did get the inquisition as to what I was doing. It wasn't enough just to say, well, I'm studying X or Y. He said, well, and why are you doing that? And how are you doing it? And so on. So, and but I found when I came over from arts and sciences, where I'd spent nearly 30 years teaching, after I finished my degree, when I came over to join the divinity faculty as dean, uh, I'd always taught divinity students, but I'd never been a member of the faculty, that he, who had, was long retired, was one of the first to welcome me, uh, one of the first to give me a hard look and so forth and say, you know, it's not going to be easy, uh, <laughs> but also to give, me, to give me really warm encouragement and welcome and support. And, I think that is the ongoing testimony of everybody, everyone I know who worked with him, knew him, and certainly it was my experience that beneath that sort of very stern, sometimes exterior, and those incisive uh, jabbing questions that he could ask was this really wonderfully supportive and caring and thoughtful man. And uh, therefore, it's a real honor for me at some point in a small public forum here to be able to pay testimony to that because uh, it, it meant a great deal to me. And he certainly was someone, if you look at his career here, was a real backbone in this school while the school was really being remade. He was hired at the beginning of the remaking of the Divinity School, I think in 53, if I remember correctly. And uh, that was just as uh, Christopher Stendhal was shortly to follow and then a group of other people whom we know from the 60s, 70s, and 80s as uh, you know, a group of scholars that really had no peers in many ways anywhere in terms of the collectivity. And he was a part of that and really the backbone of that. And I was very close to Bill Hutchison after Bill came and served as a senior tutor in Winthrop House when Bill was master and taught courses with Bill Hutchison occasionally on the Orient and the West. Uh, to undergraduates, and Bill always spoke of him, and Bill was a very matter-of-fact kind of guy, but Bill spoke of Conrad with great affection and great reverence, and uh, I think that's uh, another testimony to the kind of man that he was and what he meant to the school here. So sorry for going on so long, but I wanted to at least pay a little bit of tribute to this special man and say how delighted I am that you're having this, uh, this session tonight. So 
And thanks to all of you for taking part uh, from so many different places. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And next I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Harris, with whom I have the honor of serving on the board of the UU History and Heritage Society. Good evening. It's my honor tonight to bring greetings on behalf of the board of the UU History and Heritage Society. We're one of the newest Unitarian Universalist organizations and also one of the oldest. We are one of the newest because we have, within the past few months, merged the UUHS, the Historical Society, with the UU Women's Heritage Society. Uh, so we're excited about the programs that we are planning and the possibilities that loom ahead for us as an organization. The name Conrad Wright is intimately tied up with the history of the UU Historical Society in the last half century. And I personally am tied up with that because I have been a past president of that board and Conrad was my taskmaster. <laughs> but what he gave to our organization in terms of time, service, and energy cannot really be measured. He gave insight and direction to the board again and again. He gave an unsurpassed standard for research and he provided marvelous new insights into our history, informing us about Henry Bellows and also doing a slick hatchet job on Jedediah Morse. <laughs> he also did a lot of hands-on things for the Historical Society, not just providing research and insight into our journal and articles that were written. He kept membership lists little index cards, all <laughs> written out by hand, and he mailed all of the journals out and addressed them by hand. I think I still have his handwritten index cards for all of the members for, who knows, a half century. We don't need them anymore, but I'm kind of afraid to throw them away. They are part of this legacy. And it's a very large legacy indeed that we are honored to celebrate tonight. I want to thank Harvard Divinity School, all of our participants, and the organizers. Uh, this is a very special event for us tonight. I also want to take time to express our deep gratitude and say thank you, Conrad. Thank you for the grand legacy that we on the History and Heritage Society now must uphold. Thank you, Mark. And now we will hear from five people who have a vast uh, collective experience of Conrad Wright as teacher and colleague. I will introduce all of them uh, together and then they'll speak in uh, the carefully worked out alphabetical order. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll see the, the deep logic of the order as the evening unfolds. Uh, Kim Beach uh, is a retired Unitarian Universalist minister uh, known primarily for his work on another uh, Harvard luminary, uh, James Luther Adams, uh, and so perhaps we'll hear a little bit about how those two colleagues uh, connected. Um, also, as Kim always uh, uh, tells us at Collegium, a farmer. Uh, uh, Els Curtis uh, is known to anyone who is on the chat list of the uh, History and Heritage Society. Uh, a, a careful and sage guide of that chat list and also uh, someone who both on the chat list and in her blog uh, is creatively lifting up um, Conrad's legacy um, on a daily basis. Uh, Dean Grodson uh, is currently at the Massachusetts Historical Society, um, a very long-standing editor of the Journal of Unitarian Universalist History uh, former professor at Meadville Lombard Theological Seminary and 
the author of the fabulous uh, biography of Theodore Parker, American Heretic. Uh, Gloria Korsman uh, is research librarian here at Andover Harvard Theological Library uh, uh, and uh, someone who uh, knew Conrad for many years uh, through their shared work as lay leaders at, uh, at First Parish in Cambridge. Um, also the current president of the board of the Harvard Square Library. And David Robinson uh, is distinguished professor of American literature and director of the Center for the Humanities at Oregon State University, uh, the author of a number of important books on transcendentalism and the author of uh, the standard history of Unitarians and Universalists uh, that everyone um, who has been ordained or is on their way to it in the Unitarian Universalist tradition has spent uh, some quality time with David uh, <laughs> in the library. Uh, so they'll speak in order and look forward to hearing what y'all have to say. Okay, thank you, Dan. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I promise to speak only very briefly of James Luther Adams in, in relation to Conrad Wright. But you can hear a lot more about Adams if you come to the, um, <laughs> if you come to the, to the JLA um, forum, at, uh, which is going to be on the 10th of um, November at Andover Newton, another school, I, I believe, over across the river, um, for the James Luther Adams forum sponsored by the JLA Foundation, and which I'm giving this year. So lots more about him there. Okay. In 1979, Conrad Wright published an essay, In Search of a Usable Past. I wish to speak mainly about the usable past that Conrad found and add a few comments about him uh, on a more personal level. When I was asked to write about James Luther Adams and George Hunston Williams and Conrad Wright, for a forthcoming issue of the Journal of Unitarian Universalist History, just recently, uh, an assignment not fulfilled yet, I asked myself, why me? Perhaps because I was, in a sense, a present at the, at the creation, um, having studied here at HDS when the famous Unitarian Trinity uh, was teaching here. <laughs> How did these three relate to each other? Variously. In his autobiography, Adams said, and here's my one Adams uh, bit for the, uh, this evening. In 1986, at the time of my 85th birthday, Conrad Wright spoke wisely of the difficulties faculty members have among themselves. He quotes then Wright. Of course, Conrad Wright said, there are, ca are cases where colleagues are involved in close collaboration, but most of the time our familiarity with the concerns of our fellow faculty members are very much on a catch-as-catch-can basis. And he continued with further comments on why there is so often so little communication among academic specialists. Adams then says, nevertheless, he pointed out to me the importance of maintaining communication. One gets the impression of two gentlemen edging past each other on a narrow sidewalk. <laughs> More the pity because they, their interests really co coincided at, at some significant points. Adams tells this story. One day a visitor at the University of Chicago was seeking the office in Cobb Hall of the first president, William Rainey Harper. Encountering a scrub woman in the corridor, he asked where to find the president. She replied, I don't know, I just scrub here. <laughs> when the visitor repeated this remark to the president, Harper replied, we are beginning to specialize, you see. <laughs> Wright, Williams, and Adams were a uh, unity and diversity personified. Wright, too, was a hist excuse me, Adams also was a historian, although his way of doing history was, so, was as broad brush as 
Conrad writes, was precise. Uh, Williams was over, a, over the top on both scales, <laughs> both broad brush and very precise. They all lived in Cambridge, I think they all lived in Cambridge, and went to different churches. Wright was a devoted member of the first parish in Cambridge, a devotion that shone through on the, especially for me, on the every other year occasions when I took my high school age affirmation class from Arlington, Virginia, where I was minister, on pilgrimage to the neighborhood of Boston. Professor Wright would meet us uh, for a tour of the Cambridge Church and then for going across the yard and finally up to the tiny chapel in Divinity Hall where Mr. Emerson himself famously spoke. Now, he didn't tell us the whole Barzillai Frost story, but he was warm with these young people and very generous and with his time, and I think really glad and delighted to, to do this sort of thing. My only course with James, with, excuse me, with Conrad Wright was a reading seminar that was organized by several of us uh, Unitarian students. Um, Richard Kellaway, who's here tonight, was, was one of those, I believe, if I remember Richard. Uh, we met with him weekly and we read as I recall, almost exclusively Channing. He made sure that we knew the bright line between, in Channing between supernatural rationalism, horrid oxymoron to uh, my tender Unitarian ears, and transcendentalism. Channing may seem to cross over that in likeness to God, but he did not accept Emerson's intuitionism, Channing's Bible, remained a sacred historical text, not the world itself transcendentally apprehended. This was one of the several occasions, of some of the several corrections that Wright made to the propensity of historians to favor the radicals over the conservatives, the intuitionists over the traditionalists, and the individualists over the institutionalists. He asks, why do scholars have a persistent urge to identify Channing with transcendentalism and to minimize the point he held in common with the more conservative Unitarians of his time, end quote, and answered in general, because they are interested mostly in American lit, not in churches, uh, with the result that Channing becomes some kind of a precursor, not entirely standing on his own. Um, we should join Wright's proposed rediscovery of Channing, I think carry it forward as uh, Gary Dorian would also, I think, uh, strongly urge. At this time, uh, Dr. Wright was a lecturer in American church history and registrar of the Divinity School when I was a student. I assume he had more opportunities to offer courses after he gained his professorial appointment. His 1995 magnum opus, The Beginnings of Unitarianism in America, gave us substantial understanding of our roots, running from early New England Calvinism to Arminianism to Unitarianism. His 1977 essay, called In Search of a Usable Past, notes that we tell the story of Unitarian Universalism today as if it were, in his words, the doctrinal and ideological transformation from liberal Christianity toward free religion and then humanism, unquote. We ignore the institutionally significant story that runs, especially from Henry Whitney Bellows to the Eliots, Samuel A. and Frederick May. As a result, we have failed to generate, said Conrad, a doctrine of the church, leaving a vacuum into which various secular models have rushed. If we told our story differently, he suggests, we would see ourselves differently and also be more effective uh, institutionally. I agree. Uh, he, he would have us ask, how is a liberal church constituted in the context of seeking a doctrine of a liberal church. How is the liberal church constituted? Of all the questions, I think that's the key. Our history, rooted in the Cambridge platform, 
of 1649, suggests an answer. Mutatis mutandis, not by agreement of beliefs, but by a covenant and agreement to walk together with tolerance for differences of belief within some reasonable limits. For our Puritan forebears, the covenant is the proper, a covenant is the proper form of the church, and the saints by calling, headed by Christ, it's, it's matter. Aristotle had distinguished form and substance. Wright dealt with the ecclesial form. The theological substance was not, he seems to have thought, part of our usable past. Still, a usable past, he would agree, is a highly complex past. For instance, uh, recent contacts and significant partnerships with Unitarian congregations in Transylvania have abetted the idea that there are our Unitarian roots in Transylvania. Maybe a little bit in Poland, too, if we know that part of the story. Wright notes that this is something less than a half-truth. I don't think he puts it that way, but I think, in effect, that's what he says. Our Unitarianism is not a European import. George Williams, George Hunston Williams, agrees, quote, with the axiom of Conrad Wright that the father of American Unitarianism is John Calvin, by way of Hugo Grotius, not Faustus Socinus, unquote. That's Williams. As a parish minister, I taught this axiom of Conrad Wright uh, as the best I could, even while my heart wanted to lift up that good old Transylvania connection. Um, but the very ability to live with complexity and ambiguity is integral, I think, to our liberal religious being. <laughs> to interpret Unitarian Universalism by way of its complex history is to say, I may not be able to say exactly who we are, but I can tell you something about how we got this way. History alone explains how, how we have come to encompass so many contradictions within our denominational self. For instance, where do we get our beloved congregational polity and our perpetual itch to build a holy commonwealth? The Calvinist Puritans. Say it isn't so, they cry, but I am merciless. I tell them Unitarians are Calvinists gone to seed. <laughs> Another intellectual fray with contemporary relevance that Wright got into was found in his paper, John Cotton Washed and Made White, <laughs> which is in the George Williams Fest script, I believe. It concerns John Cotton's tract, The Bloody Tenet of Persecution Washed and Made White by the Blood of the Lamb, 1647. <coughs> That's the full title. A reply, indeed, to Roger Williams's tract, Bloody Tenet of Persecution for the Cause of Conscience, discussed. I love these uh, titles that tell you so much, I don't really need to explain any further what these two gentlemen said. <laughs> Maybe even to understand it. Spencer Levan, our colleague, also a member of that class, Richard and me and, 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 uh, uh, and Conrad, uh, studying under Conrad. Uh, Spencer Levan wrote, noted um, Conrad Wright's contribution to a fresh understanding of John Cotton in his collegium paper called, get this, Conrad Wright Washed and Made White. <laughs> <laughs> but he later published it uh, under the title Conrad Wright, Historian of American Unitarianism. <laughs> because it really had that broader reference for one thing, but I think when he reached that point, he probably said to himself, you know, uh, block that metaphor. <laughs> okay. Uh, how sorry I am that Spencer can't be with us today uh, to illuminate this matter uh, more truly than I can. He notes that, uh, Con uh, Spencer notes that Wright upheld the wisdom of John Cotton, weighty Puritan divine, against Roger Williams, the fiery Baptist dissenter, <laughs> 
despite the strong tilt of historians toward Roger Williams, of course, and his claims for the rights of individual conscience. Wright noted that conscience meant to cotton an educated consciousness or a capacity to for moral discernment. Quote, in accordance with the natural law and the revelation of scripture, and not a simply an intuitive or natural sense of right and wrong. The latter view comes to full flower only with the transcendentalists, where elsewhere, Conrad Wright noted that Theodore Parker was astonished at the very idea of an educated conscience. <laughs> Here again, um, a useful past is found in Wright's precise reading of history. Um, Today, the limits of tolerance are, are, are even ever more sharply at issue, are they not? Think of Warren Jeffs. Another use of the past that Wright fought, uh, found, in, in the story, uh, found in the story of post-Civil War Unitarianism, especially honoring the broad church institution builder Henry Whitney Bellows, like this unsung hero of our history, Conrad Wright himself played an important role in the concerns of his denomination, especially in his later years, I believe. He and James Luther Adams, individually if not together, lifted up for us the idea of covenant, the idea that has proved important for denominational renewal since the 1980s. Two concrete instances, briefly to be mentioned, the new principle statement framed as a covenant adopted by the UUA in 1984, and the Seminal Commission on Appraisal Report of 1997 called Interdependence Renewing Congregational Polity. Also, the transient and the permanent and, religious and liberal religion, a fat tome of background papers published for the 1995 Convocation of the UU Ministers Association began with an essay, The Covenant of Spiritual Freedom, drawing on the chanting that I had learned about uh, from Conrad Wright, followed by Wright's own essay called Congregational Polity and the Covenant. In that essay, he concluded, there is something to be said for the word covenant quite apart from its long <coughs> currency. Ah, yes, see, another use of the past. Even apart from that long currency, it emphasizes that the church is a community of mutual obligation which involves a sense of commitment. Even the freest of free churches needs that much discipline if it is to last long enough to accomplish something of value in this world. This was, I think, his doctrine of the church, in a nutshell, a community of mutual obligation, an idea that uses the past to help ensure that we have a future. Right? Conrad Wright spoke with modesty and with precision. I remember him at a collegium meeting when we were in hot pursuit of a very familiar topic for us, how to increase the intellectual heft and the rightful influence uh, of this motley band of liberal religious scholars. All sorts of ideas were batted about. Uh, we were going to um, require better advanced preparation and publishing of proceedings and, and setting conference themes that all would have to hew to. Professor Wright remained silent in that gathering for a long time. Finally, he spoke up. I think that we are getting from our con contributors just about the quality of papers that we are going to get. <laughs> <laughs> we all paused and smiled at ourselves. <laughs> Thank you, Conrad, for that dose of reality therapy. <laughs> I also remember the story he told uh, from down East Maine. It seems, uh, this here's the story, as, as I remember, best as I can remember it. It seems that Ezra and Alfred had set out in their fishing skiff far into the Atlantic, and when the weather turned foul, really foul, and the wind was whipping, and the waves were coming up, and the sky was dark as pitch, and the sky was swirling. As the skiff pitched then to and fro, taken on water, uh, Alf, Alf and Ez were thinking about the, the same doleful thought. This could be it. Well, Ez, said Alfred, Time to get down on your knees. So Ezra went down on his went to go down on his knees right there, but just then Alfred looked out across the water and he saw the he saw the, the clouds lifting a bit and the sun beginning to break through just a bit. And he said, 
Hold it as, wouldn't want to be beholden. <laughs> uh, I think that story is quintessential New England and quintessential Conrad Wright. And I see my time is up, so thank you, Dan, for that, that um, good word. So, what has the Cambridge platform to do with the concerns being raised before us today by the movement called Occupy Wall Street? How does the platform intersect with the lives currently describing themselves, ourselves, as the 99%? From, 1990, from 1986 to 1990, Barely a Friday went by that I did not burst into the office of Conrad Wright at about 10 a.m. with questions such as these. It should have been a match made in hell. He was a solid Yankee Unitarian, as beautifully described. I was a Midwestern social justice Unitarian reborn into a pastoral universalist. I presented myself initially with the statement that I was militantly congregational, to which Conrad replied, and bear in mind, these are two people who are meeting for the first time. Do you know the definition of a congregation? <laughs> so I immediately gave him some very carefully thought out, long, um, enunciated ideas from wh which he said, no. <laughs> There is a single definition of a congregation, and it is as follows. Now, how many of you can still say this with me? Here we go. A congregational church is by the institution of Christ a part of the militant visible church consisting of a company of saints by calling united into one body by a holy covenant for the public worship of God and the mutual edification one of another in the fellowship of the Lord Jesus. Somebody's keeping right up up there. Good job. <laughs> yeah, well, I did too, but I had to look this up. <laughs> well, this was not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> and it would appear to the casual watcher of television that this would not be the answer that the Occupy Wall Street people are looking for right now. Perhaps they might look further. People faulted Conrad. I came to him in the, um, I came of age in the 60s and 70s, so a lot of what's happening now looks very familiar. And in my generation, a lot of people faulted Conrad for concerning himself simply with the structural and relational concerns of what we took to be a socially advantaged denomination. Conrad rejected utopianism because it did not produce institutions which could serve their people and sustain themselves through changes of personnel and generations. Serving the people with stable institutions is exactly what the Occupy forces want now. But congregations gather for the public worship of God and mutual edification one of another. The Cambridge platform makes no pretense of being what Jean-Jacques Rousseau would later describe as the social contract. And indeed, um, it helps to look through the town meeting records put forward at the same time. And there you'll see that the people who form these congregations for this worship and edification set up other very, very good, highly secular institutions for financial and practical concerns, which we now address through our ministers' purses and our pastoral care networks. But if Occupy is about more than money, if it is about the quality of life, then the Cambridge platform may indeed have an intersection point with these demonstrations when it says that the institutions, that is the congregations, 
consist of and exist to serve the members of the militant visible church walking in order either before the law economical that is in families or under the law national <clears throat> or since the coming of Christ only congregational. Occupiers point out repeatedly, at least from what I can see from the very generous links provided by my Facebook buddies, that they are constantly walking in economical, um, in the economical and national order. They are doing their jobs, they're raising their families, they're obeying their laws, and they are still growing poorer. Conrad chose for his last book the title Walking Together because he wanted to remind us that the Con Cambridge platform laid out an attainable ethical standard before which all human beings are supposed to be equal and we are supposed to be self-sustaining members within these ethical and self-sustaining communities, protected by these institutions in proportion to the stewardship we provide. That's convoluted, but that's basically what I got. The platform parts company with Occupy in defining its boundaries as the realm of the physical, visible church in congregational order. Well, the UUA does not like those boundaries either. In a difficult historical moment, Conrad insisted that the Uni Unitarian Universalist Association is a finite body. I'm speaking here of what we all colloquially know as Beacon Street, even when they do not live there. Um, but their mission legally is serving the congregations. A great many UUs take issue with this mission, believing it to be immoral because so many of our forebears were the sons, daughters, vessels, and protectors of social privilege. Well, without proper congregational historiography detailing the actual lives of our actual members, I must dismiss this truism as a myth. The UUA, by its own admission, doesn't even know the current saints visible and militant. It doesn't know the definition of them. It doesn't know how to count them. It doesn't know their names. And if you've ever tried to negotiate with the UU World mailing list, you may find out that they don't know or do know where to find you. For years, I got two because I belong to two congregations. Well, in this situation, the association has no hope of describing the invisible and triumphant, those folks who should be the topics of our history. That is the honored dead. I am now, if I am uh, anything much in the world of ministry, other than a merrier and barrier, a congregational historian. Conrad was extraordinary, extraordinarily sympathetic to congregational historians. He was, and I can't explain the tenderness with which he communicated this during our friendship, a devoted and active family member. And therefore, he expressed sympathy with the limitations faced by congregational historians because they were also family members. He was a professional, and so were they. Well, in fact, those limitations on the work of congregational historians were actually not written on Mount Sinai. In fact, I discovered in doing the congregational history in Burlington that three centuries of ministers produced by this university devoted themselves to all aspects of congregational librarianship, and that was one of the goals of the education that they attained here. Only in the late 1800s did these tasks shift. They went into a pink-collar ghetto. Several generations later, they became volunteer work. I can't help um, noting, I, I believe that Conrad's wife was a librarian. That's the context in which I met her. She was helping me write a paper. But I can't help believing from my conversations with her, not even knowing who she was. Um, she asked why I was writing the paper, and I said it was for a class in the Divinity School, and she said, oh, my husband teaches there. This was in the science library. I said, oh, really? Who is that? And she said, 
Conrad Wright. And I said, oh, I'm not going to tell you my name. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I have to say that there must have been a family oneness because uh, Conrad Edick embodies so well what I always perceived from that. And now I shift into something technical here. Along with Alan Sieber, Conrad worked tirelessly to collect, preserve, staff, and make accessible the archives of the Universalist Church of America, the American Unitarian Association, and the Unitarian Universalist Association into which they were consolidated. The example of those two devoted colleagues, coupled with Conrad's constant return to the Cambridge platform in virtually all aspects of conversation on religion, leads me to ask what we are doing today to preserve, to link, and interpret our congregational archives. Conrad and Allen seized the moment of consolidation, 1961, to create a wonderful resource. 21st century library science gives us the tools to build on their work. So what is a congregational history? We have a very clear answer stated earlier. Since a congregation is a company of saints, visible and militant, a congregational history describes a small set of words and deeds by actions of those members of the 99% who have covenant to get covenanted together for mutual edification and the public worship of a particular type of God, whatever. In the model of Henry Whitney Bellows, it is time for us to take the Harvard model to regional centers. UU's Unitarian Universalists still look to Harvard Divinity School for academic vision. And therefore, it would behoove us to set up a link between the degrees offered here and the library science degrees, which have so, so greatly exceeded what was once the label of women's work at places like Simmons and the University of Rhode Island. Part of this, as Occupy Wall Street would be the first to say, would be an aspiration to restore fair work, fair pay, and fair descriptions of work to those who make themselves the stewards of the stories of our saints. What are reasonable job descriptions? At what level of polity, congregation, or district do we vest the decisions to hire, to fire, and evaluate our librarians? How long do we seal those ministerial records? But the best arc, that's the local stuff. The best archive is nothing without a usable finding aid. Just down the hall from where we sit tonight, Conrad spent decades as our finding aid. He was a switchboard for scholarship on the saints, visible, militant, and triumphant, walking together in congregation, passing through or regularly quoted. He, he published not only, he kept and published an excellent bibliography of all material on the work, and he congratulated congregational historians on their work. He constantly referred me to others whose labors never saw any fame, but which were very enriching. This today is a job to vest at the denominational level with funding, staff, and ongoing calls for results that is linked one shop one-stop shopping on the computer for, for the congregational historians to use. And when I speak then of whose records we are saving, I do not limit myself to the pew holders. I go back to that question of how do we count Unitarians. Well, up in Burlington, we did have our pew holders, and yes, they were mill owners, and yes, there were some truly dreadful stories that I will be taking people through the graveyard to in a few days and telling them about, and oh my gosh, somebody put Ira Allen off his land with 24 hours notice. You just don't want to hear this stuff, but anyway. Um, along with the lists of these famous people with their huge donations, appear much longer lists of names. One minister who buried them regularly described them as the attenders. They were also known as subscribers. And if you look at the lists for everything from the minister's salary to the cords of wood 
you'll see the big numbers up there from the big people with the fancy houses, and then you'll see two or three pages of little one and two dollar donations. These are the saints, visible and militant. If we do not recollect them, save their eulogies, collect enough information so their descendants can come to us with genealogical questions, then whether we believe in God or not, no matter what we say or do in our worship, we have failed in one of the fundamental congregational missions. And what would this do to serve our congregations? Guilt and pride are the emotional poles between which we build our identities as people, as collectivities. We Unitarian Universalists are fortunate enough living in this era that we have the means to know, to learn from, and to celebrate a very full range of saints, not just the famous, but the full 100%. I've done this work in Burlington. You can take those subscription lists, line them up next to the city directories, and find out who they were, what they did, what their hands looked like. You can put this next to the pew auction, and it all shows that along with the call for fair pay and safe work, for many, many centuries, the 99% have also been looking for the right to worship God and meet with others in mutual religious edification. People here have been telling some stories of Conrad Wright's kindness. I remember um, he invited me to give my first public lecture. It was on the 150th anniversary of, of Theodore Parker's Transient and Permanent in Christianity, and I was going to give it over at Divinity Chapel. Um, and a few days beforehand, uh, I, I came down with chicken pox. <laughs> uh, and so Conrad read my talk for me. So I, uh, I really had got to know him a few years before that, in the spring of 1988, when I decided to sit in on the last divinity school class he ever taught, Transcendentalism in New England. Uh, in that same class, I believe, was you. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, I did not actually enroll in the course, even as an auditor, because as a dissertating graduate student in the yard, I had no course requirements left to fulfill. But with Conrad's kind permission, I attended every class, did all the readings, took part in all the discussions, and, he, uh, and gave a final presentation and went on one of those famous walking tours. <laughs> I did this work because I needed to learn what Conrad had to teach uh, in order to write my doctoral dissertation on the transcendentalist and abolitionist Theodore Parker. Uh, I confess I never before had an interest in the history of Unitarianism or in religious history. I consider myself a historian of American intellectual and cultural life, which I conceived of largely in secular terms, as did all my professors in the history department where I was getting my degree. Even though Parker was a minister and a theologian, I intended to devote only a few pages of my dissertation to this aspect of his life and instead concentrate on his work as an anti-slavery activist. When I began reading his writing systematically, however, I quickly <laughs> figured out that uh, everything he wrote about, including slavery, was informed by the theological debates he was having with more mainstream uh, New England Unitarians. So in 1988, I came to Conrad, who knew the history of New England Unitarianism better than anyone else in the world. Mm -hmm. Conrad did give me the tools to understand Parker, but not only that. He convinced me that I could not make any sense of transcendentalism without understanding Unitarianism. And this was my first step to two major realizations. I realized that I could not understand the history of American intellectual and cultural life without understanding the history of religions in America, and that I could not understand the history of religions in America without understanding Unitarianism and Universalism. Owing to these realizations, I wrote a dissertation and then a book that focused primarily 
on Parker's theology. Uh, I agreed to become editor of the Journal of Unitarian Universalist uh, History and uh, a, a professor of Unitarian Universalist History at Meadville Lombard. But I've always studied Unitarian and Universalist history to illuminate American intellectual life and culture, and I have always sought to engage with other scholars in that field. I bring up this personal history, not only to acknowledge some of my intellectual debt to Conrad, but because in preparing this talk, I did some research on his early career. What I found has led me to conclude that his intellectual path was more like mine than I had first supposed. Like many others, I have thought of him as a denominational historian, dedicated especially to deepening our understanding of the Unitarian aspect of the Unitarian Universalist heritage. In fact, I once asked him point blank if he saw his particular mission as a scholar to have been the rehabilitation of the Unitarian mainstream from the aspersions cast upon it by evangelicals and religious radicals alike. And to my surprise, he shook his head and quietly said, no. That's not it. <laughs> I think I know in part why he demurred. His starting point for the study of Unitarianism turns out to have been, like mine, the study of American culture. And I think this is a part of his legacy we would do well to remember. My admittedly limited evidence for making such a claim rests primarily on records from Conrad's years as a Harvard student. He entered the college at age 16, uh, in an era of the gentleman's sea, he graduated magna cum laude in 1937. That same year, the university established a new doctoral program in the history of American civilization, and he was among the first students enrolled. By 1942, he had completed his doctoral dissertation, which became the basis for his seminal book, Beginnings of Unitarianism in America. But the United States had just entered the Second World War, and before he could make his dissertation defense, he received a letter from the draft board. A conscientious objector, he went on to serve as a hospital administrator in Massachusetts, England, and California before returning to Harvard to get his PhD in 1946. I have looked at Conrad's doctoral dissertation and at his undergraduate senior thesis. I have even looked at the handwritten notes he took for his classes. Three boxes of these are at the Harvard archives, apparently representing every course he took from the beginning of his sophomore year in college until 1941, near the end of his graduate study. I also intended to look at the large collection of personal papers that he gave to the Massachusetts Historical Society, but discovered that these have been closed to researchers until 2029. Uh, nonetheless, based on what I've seen, I think I can make some relevant observations. The first concerns the courses Conrad took. These do not portend a career in Unitarian denominational history. With one exception, which I will discuss in a moment, Conrad seems never to have taken a class on the history or philosophy of religion, nor on church history, much less a class at the Divinity School. Uh, he focused his studies instead on American history and literature broadly conceived, including classes on the writers of the South and West. Uh, he did write his senior honors thesis on a Unitarian, the American novelist and man of letters, William Dean Howells, but Conrad's topic was Howells' social thought. I don't believe the word Unitarian appears anywhere in the text. I'll double check that, but <laughs> my second observation is that one faculty member, above all, had an influence on Conrad. This was Perry Miller, oh, yeah. then a junior professor who in the 40s and 50s, as many of you know, became the most influential of all historians of New England Puritanism and one of the founders of the academic field of American studies. Conrad took his first undergraduate survey class in American literature from Miller, and as a graduate student, his only class on religious history, uh, English 170D, a survey of Protestant religious thought from Martin Luther to William James. Again, when Conrad was at the college, Mil Miller served as his sophomore tutor and his junior tutor meaning that the two of them met every week for two academic years to discuss readings in American history and literature. Conrad's notes seem to indicate that they met one-on-one. -on -one. In graduate school, Miller was Conrad's dissertation advisor, and Conrad self-consciously modeled his project on Miller's first book, published during Conrad's freshman year, Orthodoxy in Massachusetts, 1630 to 1650. The title of Conrad's doctoral dissertation was Arminianism in Massachusetts, 1735 <laughs> to 1780. Uh, 
That Conrad orbited Miller so closely, on the one hand, seems inevitable. By all accounts, Miller's force of personality and intellect exerted considerable gravitational pull. He is generally remembered as a big, rough-edged man who drank and swore and yet dazzled everyone with his brilliance. Many students who shopped his classes would hear him list such formidable course requirements they would rush for the exits. But those who stayed in their seats included some of the brightest young minds at Harvard, exhilarated by the chance uh, to pick up the gauntlet that he had thrown down. Moreover, Miller was, when Conrad met him, a young scholar nearing the height of his powers. In 1939, at the age of 34, Miller published the massive, densely written first volume of his greatest work, The New England Mind. Uh, this book, with its successor, published in 1953, would shape Puritan studies for the next generation, and probably more. Miller must have been the most exciting figure on the humanities faculty, despite some formidable competition, and Conrad's other professors included Samuel Eliot Morrison, Arthur Schlesinger Sr., and F. O. Matheson. Um, of course, Conrad wanted to study with Miller. On the other hand, Conrad's choice seems puzzling in light of his later career, because Miller notoriously disdained Unitarianism. Uh, <laughs> reared an Episcopalian, Miller had become an atheist, attracted, like many other highbrow modernists, to a tragic, strenuous, Hemingway-esque variety of existentialism. As a historian, he reconceived Puritan theology, long dismissed as a barren subject, in two ways that made it seem burningly relevant to his own time. First, he claimed it was the foundation of American intellectual life. I'll say more on this point in a moment. Second, he claimed that Puritans shared his fundamental spiritual sensibility, this, this kind of modern existentialist sensibility in a way, which he identified as the Augustinian strain of piety, using the word strain in a double sense, both dissent and violent effort. <laughs> um, he celebrated those post-Puritan figures whom he believed also shared this sensibility, notably Jonathan Edwards and Ralph Waldo Emerson. By contrast, he regarded the New England Arminians and their Unitarian descendants as spiritual Philistines. That's his word. Miller made no secret of this opinion to Conrad. Conrad himself liked to tell the story that when he submitted his dissertation on Arminianism, Miller remarked, all right, and to hell with it. <laughs> <coughs> Conrad's own scholarship challenged Miller, not only insisting that Arminians and Unitarians be taken seriously as religious thinkers, uh, but uh, by questioning, uh, notably in the case of Emerson, whether Miller's reading of his figures or uh, the, of the people he wrote about was correct. Uh, in Conrad's later career, he also began to examine Unitarianism in light of sociology and the history of institutions, subjects about which Miller had no interest. Nonetheless, I think Conrad took from Miller a conceptual framework that made his own work possible. As we all know, Conrad came from a Unitarian family and, and grew up attending the first parish here in Cambridge. But I strongly doubt, before he encountered Miller, that he considered studying the history of Unitarianism. Uh, the leading historian of Unitarianism at that time was Earl Morse Wilbur, and even though Wilbur's books were published a little bit later, uh, whose emphasis on uh, anti-Trinitarianism and the Reformation held for Conrad little fascination. Again, the theological traditions of American Unitarianism were primarily Christian and theistic, uh, while Conrad was an atheist. Yet, uh, in Miller, he found a fellow atheist who not only studied theology, in his case, Calvinist theology, but as I said before, made the subject seem burningly relevant. Miller's insistence that Puritans at bottom shared his modern, heroically existentialist sensibility would not have interested Conrad, I think, uh, as he always seemed to have found spiritual meaning, not in strenuous individualism, but in the quiet bonds of family and community. Uh, Miller's other claim about New England Puritanism, however, I think did appeal to Conrad. Miller portrayed Puritanism as a European intellectual system that was transformed on being transplanted to these shores, turning to the discomfort of its adherents from God-centered to human-centered. In Miller's view, this transformation led to the foundation of what he liked to call the American mind. Because New England Unitarianism grew from New England Puritanism, Miller's schema gave Conrad a way of conceiving of Unitarianism as a distinctly American religious movement. Through its history, in other words, Conrad saw that he could shed light on American history and literature, which deeply interested him. This, I believe, was his starting point. Not where he ended up, but his starting point. 
I'm not saying here either that Miller was right about Puritanism, nor that uh, American Unitarianism was exclusively American, because I believe neither proposition. Instead, <laughs> I want to emphasize the memory of Conrad as a historian of America, because you use Penn to remember him as someone who looked inward to study his own religious tradition, not outward to find its place in the wider culture. But just as you use today believe that on questions of social justice, they have been too long engaged in an internal dialogue rather than one with the world. Uh, so I believe you historians have written too much just for you use rather than trying to understand what Unitarianism, Universalism, and you youism mean to America history and American history and life. I think engagement of UU historians with American historians should be encouraged, and Conrad, the UU, and American historian would encourage it. Church members may not remove or depart from the church, and so one from another as they please, nor without just and weighty cause, but ought to live and dwell together. This quote from chapter 13 of the Cambridge Platform appears in the opening essay of Conrad Wright's Walking Together. Conrad interprets church covenant as an agreement made between parties and not a statement made by an individual. An exemplary and lifelong member of the first parish in Cambridge, he not only wrote about the role of covenant in liberal congregations, he walked together with us, faithfully sharing in the work and worship of the congregation for a lifetime. Conrad traced his family history in the parish back to Cyrus Woodman, who moved to Cambridge in the middle of the Civil War. His mother and maternal grandparents were active in, in Conrad's childhood years. With the important exception of summer months when vacationing in Maine, he attended worship weekly. The family occupied a pew near the center section of the meeting house and later in life, by the time I met him, he had moved to a side pew with a close and unobstructed view of the worship leaders. <laughs> Conrad believed in the power of our human institutions to amplify and extend our commitments beyond one lifetime. As his son, Conrad Edick Wright, has noted, his father's deepest personal and scholarly commitments were to institutions in general, and to three institutions in particular, Harvard, First Parish, and the Wright family. The depth of Conrad's engagement in Cambridge and in congregational life at First Parish confirms this observation. He accepted myriad assignments, but was best known as our de facto historian and occasional clerk <laughs> As the primary chronicler and interpreter of our congregation's history, he reliably brought lessons from the past to parish meetings, committee discussions, and to worship. Conrad was also a prudent fiduciary and served many years as treasurer. His meticulous financial records and careful consideration of the long-term risk of investments contributed to our current fiscal health. In 1941, while a graduate student in Harvard's Department of History, Conrad convened a group of persons interested in forming a historical society of the first parish in Cambridge. <clears throat> the first meeting drew 30 members, and Conrad was elected chairman. This society organized talks on historical subjects, preserved documents relating to the congregation's history. In January 1943, he returned from Fort Devens, where he was serving as a conscientious objector to preside over a meeting where he presented a paper when was the first church in Cambridge founded? Mm -hmm. The paper refuted a popular idea that the congregation gathered by Thomas Shepherd was continuous with the church gathered in 1633 by Thomas Hooker, which departed Cambridge in 1635. This research would be echoed many times in classes for new and prospective members. Conrad was concerned that Unitarian Universalism had become a movement of come-outers who knew little about our history and so he thought it was his duty to inform and educate us. 
Beginning in the 1970s and continuing for 30 years, he would regale newcomers with a historical talk concentrating on four episodes spanning four centuries, the founding in 1636, the standing order in the 18th, the Unitarian controversy in the 19th, and a 20th century internal controversy concerning our church architecture. <laughs> Each episode would touch upon essential elements of our polity, including the role of covenant and the use of democratic process in our congregation. He would charm listeners with his distinctive local accent. <laughs> Longtime member Timothy Warren likened Conrad's voice to recordings of Robert Frost, <laughs> which you can find on YouTube. <laughs> While our ministers enjoyed freedom of the pulpit, Conrad never hesitated to exercise his freedom of the pew by correcting historical errors. <laughs> In 1971, Ralph Helverson preached on what this church was like 125 years ago. The sermon was part of a public celebration of the 125th anniversary of Cambridge as a city. Helverson's journal entry later that day, which we are lucky to have here <laughs> at Harvard, <laughs> revealed his deep embarrassment that Conrad, along with another professor in the congregation, needed to correct him after the service. <laughs> The great bridge across the Charles was not a forerunner of the Lars Anderson Bridge, but another bridge elsewhere on the river. <laughs> In his next newsletter com com column titled, On Being in Error, <laughs> Helverson <laughs> apologized for his mistake. <laughs> yeah. When I was elected clerk of the parish in 2001, Conrad would quiz me on aspects of our history relating to my office, such as, what is the significance of section 14, chapter 67 of the general laws of the Commonwealth? <laughs> <laughs> Upon receiving the first meeting warrant that I had signed with the standing committee's approval, he promptly returned a corrected copy to me. <laughs> In addition to free history lessons, which he dispensed liberally, Conrad <laughs> would sometimes Seemingly out of the blue, <coughs> thank leaders for their contributions. He had a sweet side. When I was chair, he approached me privately and earnestly and thanked me for running the church. His quote. <coughs> when the late Elizabeth Anastas concluded her term in 1991, Conrad publicly thanked her and praised her exemplary leadership. In many of the committees he served, Conrad recorded minutes. His meticulous minutes preserve our memory of most of the 20th century. They record not only the results of votes, but also any historical information he contributed to the discussion. <laughs> As treasurer, Conrad created narrative descriptions of endowment funds and bequests that preserve donors' identities and intentions. He also collected every order of worship and every official mailing to members to deposit them in the archives. He negotiated the gift agreement that brought the first parish archives to Harvard Divinity School, where the records since colonial days are preserved and made accessible to researchers everywhere. Conrad occasionally preached. It is likely that our ministers preferred to invite Conrad to preach rather than to attempt historical sermons in his presence. <laughs> <laughs> His July 16, 1972 sermon reflected on how worship can sustain congregations over time. In his opinion, corporate worship at First Parish needed to maintain some conventional patterns to avoid alienating devoted members. This opinion was consistent with his role at Harvard and in church during the social upheaval of the 1960s. Conrad's wish that change be evolutionary and not the result of revolutionary actions of the few came into play in 1991. Standing committee discussed revising the church covenant, which was painted on the walls at either side of the pulpit of the meeting house. This covenant, also known as the Ames Covenant, had been adopted in 1896 and was no longer representing the sentiments of many in the congregation. When the chair suggested the possibility of covering the panels with decorative hangings, which an artist conveniently in the congregation had already volunteered to design and sew. Mm -hmm. Conrad, who was clerk at the time, argued that the standing committee should not give the appearance of prejudging what the whole church might decide in due course. Mm 
and suggested that the Standing Committee develop a procedure to review the covenant. A procedure for wide discussion was adopted. In 1991, the congregation debated selling its parsonage, formerly located at 6 Francis Avenue. The church had struggled to maintain the property and the minister in residence would have preferred a housing allowance to invest in a home. In a letter signed by dozens of members, a few of them in this room, <laughs> including Conrad, the group argued that if we sold the parsonage and then realized the need for a minister on the scene, comparable housing would be unattainable. Mm -hmm. In 1981, as a member of the investment committee and after a bitter conflict about divesting from companies doing business in apartheid South Africa, Conrad helped carry out the congregation's vote to divest. He authored a memo, memo urging our portfolio manager to drop Dresser Industries, now part of Halliburton, from the investment portfolio because they refused to accept the Sullivan Principles, a code of corporate contact that forbids segregationist policies. In 1994, Conrad aided the search for a socially responsible firm to handle our endowment. Robert Putnam has observed that civic participation in America reached its highest levels in the two decades following 1945. Conrad's generation cared deeply about community life. Many of his peers also cared about institutions. What is remarkable is that Conrad cared about our Unitarian and Unitarian Universalist institutions. His scholarship is prominent in two recent and influential commission on appraisal reports focusing on congregational life, one on the meaning of membership and another about congregational polity. At First Parish in Cambridge, he modeled how we ought to live and dwell together. The church eventually voted to modify the panels at the front of the meeting house. We adopted a new church covenant in 2003. We sold the parsonage. Conrad didn't welcome these changes, and yet his commitment to us never wavered. His steady presence in worship Sunday after Sunday strengthened our confidence in the institution. He did an enormous amount of work, never considering, ta never considering taking the minutes and bookkeeping below him. By nurturing our appreciation of our congregation's history, he deepened our commitment. In sum, Conrad's example is a model of community and scholarly engagement essential to the survival of our liberal religious institutions. There'll be some uh, overlap between what I have to say about uh, Conrad Wright and um, what we've heard from Dean Grodzins, but I want to thank Dean very much for the uh, information that Conrad wrote uh, an early thesis on uh, the American author William Dean Howells. Uh, so that's, uh, that's great new information uh, for me. Uh, it was a great privilege to study with Conrad Wright here at uh, Harvard Divinity School in the 1970s, which in retrospect was a high time for Unitarian uh, historiography. Conrad's collection, The Liberal Christians, appeared in 1970, and he co-authored, edited, and generally engineered into being a stream of light, uh, History of Unitarianism in 1975. Meanwhile, others had begun to make significant contributions to Unitarian history who were not church historians or Unitarians and who saw Unitarianism not so much from within but rather from, as part of a larger fabric of United States cultural and intellectual history. Daniel Walker Howe's The Unitarian Conscience uh, was published in 1970. Uh, Lawrence Buell's 1973 Literary Transcendentalism recognized the aesthetic and literary impact of Unitarian discourse. William R. Hutchison began his important 1976 study, The Modernist Impulse in American Protestantism, with a chapter on the Unitarian movement and the spirit of the age. And in 1981, Andrew Del Banco published William Ellery Channing and the Liberal Spirit in America. 
These were groundbreaking works by scholars who rose to great prominence in their fields and whose cumulative works suggest the enormous power of American Unitarian thinking in the shaping of progressive thought in the United States as a whole. Uh, of course, uh, the earliest of these expressions of Unitarian thinking in US culture uh, was that which was elucidated by Conrad Wright in the beginnings of Unitarianism in America in 1955. The Unitarian thinking uh, that Wright describes here was not yet, of course, Unitarian. But Wright is still the unsurpassed um, explanation of the roots of the American Unitarian movement, mm -hmm. an account of the course of intellectual events, controversies over religious doctrine, after all, that gave birth to the Unitarian denomination in the United States. To understand those controversies, we have to return to Calvinism, the body of doctrines embraced by the earliest European immigrants to New England. The scholar who played the central role in bringing the history of Calvinist thinking uh, in New England back to life, as Dean has uh, very, uh, very well shown here, uh, was Perry Miller, whose The New England Mind remains a classic work on religious thought that grounded the earliest New England churches. Conrad Wright was Miller's doctoral student at Harvard, and the first version of the beginnings of Unitarianism in America was Wright's doctoral dissertation, written under Miller's supervision and completed in uh, the 1940s. It's interesting to consider that the essential history of American Unitarianism, ironically, was written by a student of the leading historian of Puritan Calvinism. The intertwining narrative of Wright's history and Miller's work on Puritanism becomes even more interesting, I think, a decade or so later after uh, Wright had completed his dissertation when he published it in 1955, uh, appearing ver at very nearly the same time that Miller, who'd become an academic titan uh, by that time, published a collection of his essays and dresses, addresses called Errand into the Wilderness. This collection included what is arguably Miller's greatest and most influential essay, From Edwards to Emerson, which appeared in the New England Quarterly originally in 1940. Miller's essay was important and appealing to American historians and to literary scholars because it linked two of America's most powerful and influential religious thinkers, each of whom seemed to represent diametrically opposed poles on the theological spectrum, Calvinism uh, in Edwards, transcendentalism in Emerson. Miller made Edwards and Emerson into exemplars of a common religious experience, of religious experience itself, of the encounter with the holy. With the Puritan sense of grace resurfacing after more than a century in Emerson's transcendental mysticism. By suggesting a kinship or continuity between Edwards and Emerson, Miller offered the outlines of something like an Einsteinian unified field theory of New England intellectual history, <laughs> one that affirmed the centrality of Edwards and rendered uh, Emerson part of an Edwardsian lineage, albeit in a somewhat diminished condition. <laughs> Emerson was, as Miller put it in the headnote to the essay, an Edwards in whom the concept of original sin had evaporated. <laughs> Neither Miller nor Wright approved of Emerson, though on different grounds. <laughs> the first conversation I had with Conrad Wright about transcendentalism was when I had discovered the work of uh, the mystical poet Jones Vary, uh -huh. an associate of Emerson. Uh, I found him in the, uh, in the, the lunch area in Divinity <laughs> Hall, where he usually took his lunch. And was always happy to speak with students. Uh, Professor Wright, I told him, I've, I've just discovered the poems by one of Emerson's uh, colleagues, uh, Jones Vary. <coughs> Vary, he said, Vary. He was off his rocker. 
Not, not, an, not a, a, an auspicious beginning for work that I, that I later did under his supervision uh, uh, about Vary and his Unitarian background. Um, at any rate, um, Miller's argument, powerful as it was in many ways, distorted Emerson, who struggled mightily with access to the mystical and was increasingly pulled into ethical action, as the Puritan and, and also, uh, in a sense, made Puritanism more far-reaching than it actually was. It left to those who were attentive a strange discontinuity in the development of theological ideas in New England. What, after all, had happened theologically between Edwards and Emerson? Although his work did not engage Miller's explicitly, Conrad Wright provided the answer. In explaining the origins of American Unitarianism, he engaged the text that Miller had omitted and thus provided the missing narrative of one of the greatest shifts in American intellectual history, mm -hmm. the decline of New England Calvinism and the rise of its liberal alternative. Wright did not write against Miller. And as Dean has elucidated here very clearly, uh, there was a close relationship there. To him, my indebtedness over many years is great, Wright wrote in his preface. But he saw the course of ideas in early American society quite differently, and that difference has important implications. Wright's narrative focuses not on Edwards, but on his nemesis, Charles Chauncey, minister of the First Church in Boston. Mm -hmm. Chauncey was skeptical, uh, skeptical about what we might call the spiritual reliability of the outpouring of emotions in the re re revivals of the Great Awakening. And he was alarmed about the disturbances within the New England churches that such outpourings were causing. Chauncey was not a rebel uh, or revolutionary. As Wright noted, he and his allies regarded themselves as defenders of the traditional New England way. Even in matters of doctrine, Wright adds, they insisted that the revivalists were the innovators and called to their support the shades of John Winthrop and Thomas Shepard of Increase and Cotton Mather. Chauncey, Jonathan Mayhew, and other Arminians, as they came to be called, were protecting a beloved institution and the sense of the critical importance of creating and maintaining vital institutions would become a central theme in Wright's later work in Unitarian history. Frederick Henry Hedge, Henry Whitney Bellows were his exemplars, not Ralph, Wal Ralph Waldo Emerson, or Jonathan Edwards. And he once remarked when I mentioned James Freeman Clark, now there is a transcendentalist worthy of respect. <laughs> <laughs> this was the uh, articulation and spread of, uh, thus the articulation and spread of Arminianism in the mid 18th century represented the lost or overlooked or perhaps repressed connecting link between Edwards and Emerson but it was a link best characterized through the change it embodied, and as Wright reminded us, a very significant change it was. The development of, of, and I quote him here, a new set of basic assumptions about human nature and human destiny. Perry Miller himself identified uh, the key aspect of this change when he described Emerson as an Edwards with no original sin. And as Wright demonstrated in detail, the point at which Calvinist theology, and I quote him again here, first came under sustained attack, sustained attack was the doctrine of original sin. Indeed, he goes on to comment that some of the Orthodox seemed to realize that the battles with the Arminians would be won or lost on this issue, for if the concept of total depravity should disappear, the rest of the orthodox scheme would become irrelevant. We all, of course, consider a doctrine such as original sin reasonable when applied to others, 
<laughs> but not so readily to ourselves. Uh, as Emerson wrote, every man thinks a latitude uh, for himself, uh, which is no wise to be indulged in another. Chauncey and his allies with the, assistant, uh, with the assistance of English descending theologian John Taylor of Norwich developed a theory of individual human agency to counter it, which did not paint men and women as saints, but as, and I quote uh, right again, a mixture of good and evil tendencies, capable of virtue but only through the exercise of reason, judgment, and discipline. This was the basis of the doctrine of probation Life is a process of moral proving and trial that Wright elsewhere suggested was crucial uh, to the Unitarianism of later generations, uh, such as that of Channing and the Wares, and that I've argued was also a crucial context for Emerson's development. Wright elucidates another essential belief of 18th century Arminians. Um, of the partic that is of particular historical importance to the Unitarianism that would follow. Chauncey and his colleagues resisted the concept of instantaneous conversion expounded in the Great Awakening revivals, the source of much of the dramatic emotionalism of those events. Wright explains that Chauncey and others asked whether it is possible for one to be saved without experiencing the intense emotional uh, up, upheaval to which the revivalists pointed as evidence of, their, of the gracious estate. The answer was that conversion might come in many forms and in different frames of time, incorporating mind and action as well as emotions. The Arminians regarded conversion as more, character, as more characteristically an extended process rather than a discrete experience. Channing actually uh, explained his own spiritual history uh, in these terms. This defense of what Wright calls the possible variety of Christian experience would become a hallmark of the Unitarian movement, an expanded notion uh, of the conversion experience that entailed a much richer definition of the spiritual life and intimately associated spiritual experience with moral action. Chauncey and his allies had contended in Wright's word that the test of conversion is the fruit of the process. A view that linked the spiritual with the ethical, that linked grace with works. A series of Unitarian thinkers from Channing to Parker to Francis Greenwood Peabody to James Luther Adams would embrace this conception of religion as envisioned practice. One of the most important elements of such practice we have to remember is the building and nurturing of the crucial institutions that enable both individual fulfillment and larger social justice. Remembering Chauncey as a protector of institutions as well as a theological innovator is thus important. The imperative of building and sustaining liberal institutions was close to Conrad Wright's heart and it became the central focus of his later work. The role of historical chronicler and yet advocate for an institutionally liberal church may well be the way that contemporary Unitarian Universalists now know and will remember Conrad Wright best. With crucial liberal institutions of all kinds, from churches through schools, museums, and government programs, now under serious attack, his work has, I think, a new significance and immediacy. Thank you all so much. I, I really feel blessed to have, have been with all of you tonight. I think there's such, such heartfelt and illuminating uh, insights and memories.
At this point, I'd like to um, invite Professor Wright's uh, son, Conrad Edick Wright, uh, to say a few words uh, in response. When the organizers of this meeting got in touch with me last summer uh, and asked me to prepare something formal, uh, I suggested that I had written about my father a number of times, and I didn't really think I had anything fresh to say. Um, that being the case, I declined to, uh, to, to write a paper, but I thought that it was appropriate to uh, offer at least a brief response. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of the organizers of this, of this uh, event and all of the people on the panel, uh, not just on my own part, but on the part of my uh, brother and sister, my wife, uh, children, all the members of our family, uh, we very much appreciate uh, this recognition of, of uh, someone who we care about very deeply. Um, when, I, when I started to think about this session, and certainly listening to the papers this evening, uh, I began to wonder how my father would have responded to this event. <laughs> um, in, in fact, I think that he would have been gratified. Like so many people, as he advanced in years, and he, of course, advanced quite, quite far in years since he died at the age of 94, uh, he began to wonder uh, whether what he had done would make any difference. Uh, and this was, this was a, a serious and essentially an existential uh, concern of his. And so I think he would find it gratifying to, uh, to know that, uh, that uh, people remembered him, uh, remembered him affectionately, appreciated the work that he had done. Uh, in, in every sense, this, this would make him feel, I think, happy and satisfied with the kind of, of work that he had done and the life that he had lived. Um, how, how he would have responded directly to the praise is another matter. <laughs> he always believed that when someone praises you, it's important to respond with modesty. And if modesty is impossible, uh, then false modesty will have to do. <laughs> um, let, <laughs> let, 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 let me say a little bit about the, about the papers that were given this evening because I certainly recognize my father in all of them. Uh, but I would, I would divide the papers up into two groups. Dean, and to some extent David, talked about uh, the historian who was a Unitarian. Uh, Kim, uh, Els, and Gloria talked about the Unitarian who was an historian. And I think that this gets at a, an interesting uh, dualism in his life, in, in some respects a tension. Someone who, uh, who spoke to different communities, to, uh, to uh, different groups of people, in each case knowing what they needed to hear, uh, and making sure that they, that they learned and understood from him uh, what they should be doing uh, heading into the future. Um, this, the, 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 two, the two facets of him can be seen in tension, and to some extent I think they were, uh, but I think he derived an energy from this tension. This evening, before the, before the program, a number of us gathered for, for dinner, and I was sitting next to, to Dan McCann and, and noted that I'd been asked several weeks ago to... Uh, sit on a, uh, a dissertation committee uh, at Brown, someone who uh, we at the Massachusetts Historical Society had given a, a short-term fellowship had uh, asked me to, uh, to sit on the committee. There's a woman in the Religious Studies Department at Brown, uh, and uh, I went down uh, a month or two ago for the, uh, the prospectus defense and found myself as the only historian in a room of, of religious studies scholars because she was in the religious studies department there. And what struck me, uh, listening and participating in the, in the conversation, was the extent to which uh, I was speaking one language and they were all speaking a different language. They were speaking a language that was essentially uh, a theoretical language of, of uh, religious scholarship. Uh, one focused on, on the great thinkers who had something to say about religion, whether we're talking about theologians on the one hand, or sociologists, or psychologists, or philosophers on, on the other hand. Uh, at any event, 
uh, what, uh, what I, I see in my father, having spent his career at the Divinity School, is someone who uh, profited in a great sense from having been at a place where not everyone was thinking about religion in a kind of theoretical, philosophical way, but religion was a practical, everyday issue. Uh, if you look at his scholarship, and people have mentioned his interest in institutions, uh, that, that gives a sense of the kind of, of issue that was important to him, and in no small measure I think it was important to him because he was teaching people who were going to become ministers in many cases, people who would be facing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, the problems of writing sermons, the problems of dealing with standing committees, the problems of dealing with church finance, uh, and so he cared very deeply about uh, the, the kinds of practical issues that his students were going to face. At any event, it seemed to me that as I, as I think about my father, I think of him, you know, I, could, I could apply a number of different terms to him. He was certainly a Canterburyian. <laughs> uh, he was a New Englander. He was a Harvardian. He was a Unitarian. He was an Astorian. In each of these facets of his being, he could be both the historian who was a Unitarian and the Unitarian who was a, an historian, trying to come to some sort of middle ground between, uh, on the one hand, uh, someone who, who uh, spoke to a, a wider academic audience, and as Dean and David have, have both noted, uh, he had uh, the best training of his day, probably, uh, for a scholar. So he, th this was, this was, a, uh, this was a, a world that he could engage with and do so successfully. Yet, yet someone who was very much concerned with, with practical issues, the, the sort of person who became interested in Henry W. Bellows. So, so I, 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 I simply want to thank, uh, once again, the people who have taken part in this, uh, and to thank them as well for what it seems to me is collectively, probably not individually, but collectively, I think a, quite an interesting, engaging, and, and fruitful portrait of my father. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in just a few minutes, we will we will move uh, to the brown room for uh, some refreshments and. Uh, informal follow-up conversation, but we do have a little bit of time if anyone would like to pose a question or uh, share a very brief uh, thought or memory. Uh, Ralph, we've got a microphone coming to you. Well, in the, in the spirit of Conrad's precision, I want to correct the impression that the entire um, Unitarian Trinity lived in Cambridge. <laughs> George lived in Belmont. <laughs> when I returned, well, hold the microphone a little closer. Okay. When I returned to join the faculty in 1965, largely by dint of having been Jim Adams' teaching fellow earlier, we purchased the home of George Ernest, uh, of, of George Hunston Williams, in Bell. In gosh, I'm in running Bell. ahead here in Arlington, 82 Bartlett Avenue. He was returning to Belmont to resume his career as a bird watcher on the grounds of McLean Hospital. He returned from time to time to sit in the rooms of the house on Bartlett Avenue and commune with the spirit of his son who had died there. Mm -hmm. But um, to my knowledge, he, he didn't live in Cambridge unless it had been very early on. Okay. Richard? Perhaps I'm not the only one mostly aware of Conrad within the larger Unitarian Universalist community. What I don't know is his relationship to the larger academic community and what participation he had in the community of American scholars of religious history, that kind of thing. Any of you like to? Well, as far as I know, he was uh, quite active in the um, the um, the meetings of the uh, is it the Society for Church History, mm -hmm. American Society of Church History, uh, and and so saw his you know academic home or standing 
there, um, but I can't uh, go much further than that. It, insofar as ha was his work accepted and, and uh, thought highly of, definitely yes. Uh, uh, it, there, I mean, he made plain this entire era of, of the Enlightenment, essentially, in, as, it, as it affected the New England churches uh, in the middle and late 18th century. Uh, an anecdote which probably many people have heard, but which I heard Conrad Wright say one day, was about him and Perry Miller, that the minister at the church had advertised a sermon title relating to transcendentalism or some such subject, but he fell sick. And so uh, Conrad, the graduate student, uh, got to fill in. Miller came, and at the end said, because they knew each other well, uh, Conrad, if I'd known you were preaching, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was to find out what Unitarians are saying, and he already knew. <laughs> from Con Hi, I knew Conrad as a scholar, a historian, from my first beginnings of ministry in 1957. It was not until I got to the ministry in Cambridge in 1978 that I met the, scholar, the person that Gloria was talking about, Conrad as a real churchman. The things that he helped us get through negotiating the, the whole process was probably in those nine years more important to my ministry than all of the scholarly achievements which I dearly value. Uh, a, a footnote um, relative to Perry Miller, <laughs> only, <laughs> not Conrad Wright. Um, Joe Barth told me, and this, all I know about this is what Joe said, he was minister of King's Chapel, and that Perry Miller came to the church and was very interested, and apparently Joe would have deep conversations with him, I guess, but Perry Miller could never quite bring himself to actually join the church. <laughs> <laughs> so he got that close, according to Joe Park. Mm -hmm. Thank you all again, uh, and we will now um, continue the conversation over in the Brown Room. Uh, if you don't know where it is, Follow the crowd.